First topic we will talk about is material disbalance. Concretely in this video we will talk about positional sacrifice. So that's a situation where you sacrifice one pawn or you sacrifice the exchange. Even in some situations you will sacrifice the whole piece, but you will get activity. You will ruin opponent's pawn structure or you will attack his king. Um, or in general you will activate your pieces. So you will have compensation for sacrificed material. This is the most difficult part of chess because the question is when we can sacrifice material, when we can give up the pawn for counterplay. And of course it's uh, impossible <coughs> excuse me, to uh, give good answer on this question because everything depends. There are some normal us usual positions where you can be pawned down, but still you can uh, be better. And on the board you cannot have feeling that you have better position. But simply your pieces are organized better or your opponent has few little weaknesses or some other simple problems in his positions and simply you, you are better. Uh, so don't be afraid of uh, losing one pawn or losing the exchange in middle game because you know that in middle games the board is uh, full of pieces, full of combinations and uh, opportunities. Uh, so if you are down material, if that is only one pawn, uh, or maybe, like I said previously, something more, still you can have good position. And very often you will see and you know that uh, you, do, you did it on purpose, you sacrificed material, but you got very, very good position. Uh, we will start with the game which was played on uh, Vikanse between Carson and Giri, and uh, let's see how did it go. So Magnus was white in this game. Uh, it was Catalon, and Catalon is uh, an opening for which it is specific that uh, white almost always sacrifice one pawn, but white has activity, white is better developed, white has extremely strong bishop on g2. And generally, usually after opening, white is uh, at least slightly better. Bishop g2, short castle, short castle, dc4. Uh, usually you will see in this video course, uh, I will not analyze uh, the whole games. Because simply uh, we don't analyze openings and we will not waste time on openings. But uh, I would like to show you uh, this one because first of all it was played uh, by... World Champion, Black was also a fantastic player, a super grandmaster. And uh, why did something for people who don't play Catalan something very strange in the opening? Uh, actually, at this moment, White played knight a3. I mean, still, this is theory, but you can see that what White did. First of all, White's pawn structure is ruined. Second, White is pawned down. Third, we cannot say that black has obvious weaknesses in his position. But why is engine showing that this position is equal or white is even slightly better? Or why did Magnus play this? And exactly this is positional sacrifice. And this is material disbalance. So white is down material, but white has bishop spare. Bishop on g2 is much stronger than bishop on c8. Uh, Generally, white will control more space in the future, and somehow it is very, very easy to play for white. So here, black needs to find the best moves. White shouldn't. White just should develop pieces. Uh, let's see what happened ne next. Bishop d7 was played in the game. Game. Uh, the main move for white at this moment is knight e5. Knight e5, and this is well-known position. Uh, Magnus played something quite new. Magnus played a4. This is novelty. Magnus was prepared for this, of course. He analyzed already this position. Uh, the idea behind this move is very simple. So a4, bishop a3. White wants to develop bishop. Like we said when we were talking about white's advantage here, white has bishop spare. Black doesn't have dark square bishop. So dark squares are generally weak in black's position. And you can notice that this bishop will control a lot of squares. Bishop c6, still uh, they play just usual things, developing pieces, so nothing special is happening on the board. Rook c1, 
now white decided to take on c4 previously white didn't want to take because black has knight b6 and white will lose a4 pawn uh, what is not that important because a4 pawn is double pawn and uh, queen c3 was played by magnus knight a4 queen b3 what to say about this position so now they traded two pawns and uh, first and probably the most important principle about uh, playing when you are down material so actually when you sacrificed material for activity of your pieces uh, first important principle is that uh, try to stop trading pieces what is perfectly logical i mean if you're down pawn or you're down the exchange of course you you will avoid trading pieces otherwise if you trade pieces if you simplify position your opponent will slow slowly uh, consolidate his position and you will have problems so you want to keep pieces on the board that is very important king queen d5 was played by uh, giri and this is decisive moment so this is the most important moment in the game uh, here white made big decision and we can say that uh, here he won the game you can stop video at this moment and you can calculate moves you can try to find best move for white uh, like we said so black wants to trade to trade queens and the question is how should white continue even if white trades at this moment so even if white plays something usual like knight h4 that move perfectly makes sense black will trade on b3 white will take a b3 and probably position will be equal because still white has a very active position and black has some weaknesses so after black takes the queen we will take then we are putting pressure to the bishop with our bishop and at the same time we are putting pressure to the knight if black trades bishops as well then c7 will be weak so these things are problems in black's position but if uh, black finds best moves so few next moves are the most important position is totally equal so they will have uh, an end game which is equal but how to fight for advantage here here white played fantastic move rook c6 and exactly this is positional sacrifice after queen c6 white doesn't have anything concrete so white doesn't have some crazy attack black king is totally safe we cannot say that uh, white will trap for example black queen or something but magnus sacrificed the exchange because he felt and he calculated uh, next few moves and he realized that black has huge problems here after knight e5 first of all you can notice that bishop on g2 is fantastic so we cannot say that for example rook on e8 is better than this bishop i mean objectively maybe rook is better than that bishop but uh, if you uh, calculate moves you can realize that bishop on g2 is so strong this bishop is fantastic first of all look how many squares it controls uh, second b7 is weak point third a very important thing about this position look bishop on a3 we were talking about this position about the position of the bishop on a3 so that bishop is controlling also so many squares so bishops a3 bishop g2 they are controlling too many squares knight on e5 is active queen on b3 is active rook will come to b1 in the future uh, now let's talk about black's pieces knight on a4 that that knight is actually the biggest problem for black uh, position of the queen isn't ideal because you will see also later queen will be all the time under attack rooks totally undeveloped doing nothing so that is white's advantage here white is more active better developed uh, his pieces controls control sorry more space and that's why uh, magnus this uh, did this so that's why magnus sacrificed the exchange at this moment white is uh, down one pawn and the exchange but still this is slightly better position for white queen b5 was played by giri and now uh white did very logical and best move so i'm sure you would play that as well white played queen c2 of course white doesn't want to trade queens because in case white takes bishop b7 white will take back the exchange but black's position will be better 
So what will happen? Rook b8, bishop c6, queen b3, a b3. Now uh, knight on a4 is under attack, rook on e8 as well, but it doesn't matter because black has knight c3, and after bishop e8, black will simply take knight e8. Now it is equal position, but the problem for white is that e2 pawn is under attack, b3 pawn as well. And, and objectively, black has advantage. So this is not good for white, and of course it is not in the spirit of principles we were talking about. I mean white sacrificed the exchange and pawn, and of course he will keep queens on the board. That's why Magnus played queen c2. Uh, this position is also very interesting. The question is how should black continue? So now it is very easy to play for white, because uh, next few moves are very obvious. White wants to play rook b1 then black's queen is almost trapped. But if you are a real master, you need also to know, or if you want to become real master, uh, you need to know to defend yourself as well. So it is not, not always about attack, it is also about defense in, in chess. And here you can try to find best move for black, which is extremely difficult, which wasn't found by Gary. Uh, so you can stop video and try to calculate the best move for black. In the game it was played knight d5, which was a mistake. After knight d5 white needs to play just simple moves. And also after knight d5 white didn't spend a lot of time. So he played rook b1, queen a5, bishop d5, e d5, rook b7 and black's position is uh, collapsing. Let's move back. So we cannot say that now white is winning. For sure there is something good for black, but the question is what? And the answer is knight b6. This is amazing move. It is extremely difficult to find this move. Uh, why is it difficult to find this? Because with this move black will give back material. And that is very important point of positional sacrifice. So if your opponent sacrificed something, let's say he sacrificed one pawn for activity of his pieces. Why couldn't you do the same? So why uh, can't you give back that pawn and you will get activity for your pieces? So if you see that uh, you, are in, uh, you are in danger and your opponent is putting pressure to you, then logically you will give back material and position will be okay. Sometimes equal, sometimes you will be a bit worse, but in every case, very often you will survive. Uh, so that's why uh, here best move is knight b6, but again it is very difficult, you know, you play a game and you are up one pawn or the exchange, you just want to fight to keep it, you don't want to take, uh, to give it uh, back, what is a uh, very often mistake, like it was in this game, and uh, here you can see that if black sacrificed uh, the pawn on b7, so if black gave back material, this position could be uh, equal. So knight b6 is best move for black, bishop b7, I mean there is nothing else what white can do, so white probably has to take, and now also it is uh, about one very difficult move for black, which is, you know, not easy to find, and uh, uh, even Giri, all of you know who is uh, Anish Giri, I mean, he's fantastic grandmaster, even he didn't find this. But the move for black is knight c4. Very strong move, and after this move, uh, they will trade a lot of pieces, and most likely they will face equal endgame. So knight c4, bishop a8, for example, knight a3. So we don't take on a8, we take on a3, that's the trick. Uh, queen c7, we take rook a8, white takes on f7, we move the queen. We have, uh, now we have an unclear position, which is not easy to play for white, because white has, white is uh, knight down, okay, white has few pawns for the knight, but still, uh, this position is fine for black, and like I said, okay, this is unclear position, it is totally playable, who knows what would happen here. Instead of queen c7, white can choose something simpler, so white can simply play queen c6. After this move, they will trade everything. So queen e2, bishop b7, queen a2, queen c7, rook f8, bishop a6, everything is traded and 
obviously this position is equal. Uh, so knight b6. I said previously that uh, the biggest problem for black here is knight on a4. Now you can see why. Because that knight is all the time under attack. And that knight keeps black uh, queen tied down for it. So that's why black simply needed to solve that problem immediately. So immediately to move back that knight and to activate that knight. And we saw that after knight b6 simply white doesn't have much. Uh, let's see just very quickly what happened in the game. So like we said, knight d5, rook b1. Uh, black has to move the queen, so only square is a5. Then Magnus took bishop d5, what is of course best for white, e d5. Uh, here, for example, it, it can be tricky, so bishop b4 would be mistake. Although this is very tempting. Why is this tempting? Because after black moves queen b5, we have bishop e1, queen is trapped. But the point is that after bishop b4, black can simply go queen b6. And after we win that knight, then black has a5. Now we lose bishop. And actually black is winning. So this position is dynamic. There are a lot of things uh, to think about. A lot of variations to calculate. So here it's necessary to be very very careful. Um, I mean Magnus played very quickly this position. Uh, but okay I mean his intuition and uh, his feeling for this kind of positions is uh, almost perfect. And he can do something like that. Uh, but still, also sometimes he needs to be careful. So he took rook b7, best move, attacking c7. Now he's threatening bishop b4 and queen is totally trapped. So here c5 was played by black. And now white got extremely strong attack with queen f5. Still, black is uh, the exchange up. So, so still black has rook for the bishop. But this position is totally winning for white. And now we see that uh, very often... You can sacrifice materials, you can sacrifice the exchange or pawn uh, to attack opponent's king. To open up it or simply to have made threats or something similar. Like here. So here white has uh, too strong attack. Rook f8, knight f7. And uh, okay, here we can stop because simply this position is uh, totally winning for white. Uh, again, the most important moment in this game is rook c6. I mean, beautiful positional sacrifice by Magnus Carlsen. And we saw that black has a uh, chance to equalize position after uh, knight b6. But simply, it is not so easy to give back material. And Giri missed that. And unfortunately for him, he lost uh, this game. Uh, so this was first game. On this topic, let's see the next one. Uh, the next one was played between uh, two very strong Serbian uh, grandmasters, Injic Alexander and Ivan Ishevic. Ivan, both of them are grandmasters who have ratings uh, over 2600. Probably you heard for them. And let's see how did it go. Usually their games are very dynamic because both of them are how to say fighters and uh, both of them uh, like to play very sharp position and to play very dynamic chess so that's why uh, also in this game they faced a uh, very interesting position uh, it doesn't matter what happened uh, at the beginning so they had king sindian with very strange move order for white makogono variation and uh, we will we will go to early middle game so here Injic, so white, white played bishop e2. What to say about this position? So this position is probably by engine better for uh, white, of course, usually in Benoni pawn structures. So this is Benoni pawn structure with bishop on g7 and pawns on c5 and d6. So usually in this kind of pawn structures, uh, engine gives advantage to white. But uh, practically it is not easy for white because you can see also here white uh, opened up his king side. Black can have a very active play here and black has counter play. We will see how. And uh, generally we can say that uh, white is better but 
position can be very sharp. In the game, uh, there was one very interesting move played by Black here, so you can stop video already here, and you can try to find counterplay for Black. You know that in Benoni, Black usually, not always, but usually Black plays on the queen side. What is perfectly logical, Black has bishop on g7, and it totally makes sense to play on queen side. Uh, and very often, in the spirit of Benko Gambit, Black can sacrifice one pawn. So also that opening, for example, Benko Gambit is generally opening in which you you positionally sacrifice your pawn and you get counterplay on queen side. Here Black did something similar. Black played b5. So very interesting move. Black wants to open up b file and uh, to get counterplay. Bishop b5, rook b8, rook b1. This is the most important moment. Uh, which happened in the game, and here it could be very, very interesting. Uh, in the game it was played h5, which wasn't so good, and uh, white uh, managed to win this game, so we will not analyze what happened later, that's not so important for us. Also later it was uh, quite interesting, but uh, black uh, sacrificed too much material, and white won. But the question is, what is better than h5? How should black continue? So here you can stop video and you can think about black's move. You can take like 15 minutes, 20 minutes, because position is extremely sharp and complicated. Uh, like we said, black sacrificed pawn on the queen side, so if black isn't very fast, white will just keep material and that's it. Maybe later try to simplify position and you know it will be too late for black to fight for counterplay so black needs to fight for the counterplay immediately and after black played b5 black should stop thinking about material and i'm surprised that uh, ivan Nishovic didn't find this idea because this is totally in his style so he likes to play uh, this kind of positions so here best move fantastic move for black is rook b5 now we have position where black uh, sacrificed rook for bishop, so black sacrificed the exchange, and black got very active position. But this is not the end, so this is just beginning. Rook b5, knight b5, we take knight e4. White takes knight e4, we take rook e4. And now things are becoming very, very interesting. White takes rook d6, uh, sorry, knight d6. Perfectly logical move. I mean, white is winning pawn, and it seems that black cannot do much. But black has one more positional sacrifice. Black will sacrifice rook e3. One more time, black will sacrifice the exchange. And one more time, black will fight for activity. And this time, black will get activity. And black will have fantastic counterplay. It will be so uncomfortable for white. You will see why f e3 i mean white has to take the rook then black goes queen h4 which perfectly makes sense king d2 black plays bishop a6 and now you can realize why black should play like this so like in previous game by magnus carlsen we saw that magnus had fantastic bishops also here black has fantastic bishops first of all bishop on g7 Second bishop on a6. Look how many squares these bishops are controlling. So many. Look also your knight. You will jump knight e5 at some moment. You are touching all these weak squares. Look your queen. You have queen, e queen f2. And you have only one target. The king on d2. What about white? So this is not winning for uh, black, of course. So th this position is totally playable and... I would say totally unclear position. Uh, but I think it's much more difficult to be white here. Because first of all, white's rooks are totally useless. Rooks are doing nothing. Okay, white can activate the rook. White can play rook f1 uh, to give back maybe material or rook e1 or something similar. But still, white isn't active. And white's king is in big danger. 
probably best move for white at this moment is knight e4. Knight e4, and here you just don't think about material. So you play this position like nothing happened. And for example, here black plays simply queen e7, attacking the knight. White does, for example, queen a4 to defend the knight on e4 and to attack the bishop. Then we go bishop e7, attacking d5. In the future, again, black will just play slowly, so black uh, has enough time because white needs so many moves to consolidate his position, to uh, find the safest square for the king, to find better squares for his rooks. So here, white has huge problems. Uh, but still, this position is unclear, so everything is possible to happen here. And uh, you can see that this position is a very nice example to show what is positional sacrifice. So this is that. When you sacrifice material, when you don't count material, was it uh, the exchange or was it one pawn? Or maybe it was you sacrificed two rooks for two minor pieces. It doesn't matter, you got activity. Very often, uh, opponent's king will be in danger, or simply his pieces are not active, like here. So again, rook b5 is a fantastic idea for black, and this variation is uh, very forcing. White has to take, we take on e4. Uh, here, instead of knight e4, white can also play short castle, but also this position is totally unclear. I mean... Uh, here white has a rook for uh, the bishop, but we have h5, maybe queen h4, uh, knight on uh, e5 is fantastic, knight on b5 seems totally lost, and uh, also this is unclear position. Uh, so this was chance for Ivanishevich to sacrifice the exchange, later the other exchange, and uh, it would be very interesting uh, game, I'm sure. So again, uh, don't count material, so play for activity, and very often you will face these kind of situations in your games, and you will just need to sacrifice one pawn or the exchange, or even the whole piece, what doesn't happen so often, but maybe it can happen. So simply don't count material, you play uh, for activity of your pieces, and that is called uh, positional sacrifice.